Thank you for watching this morning. If you're watching this live stream or if you're hearing this later on or watching this message later on, thank you for joining us. And please let us know how we've blessed you. Um, and so our title for today is Our Glorious Eternal Destiny. In the first chapter, we saw that Christ is superior to the angels as the Son of God. Last week, we then saw the author take a moment uh, to briefly tell us that given the facts that he presented, that Christ is superior to the angels, we must, we absolutely must pay attention to Jesus to avoid spiritually drifting away. Well, in today's passage, the author will resume his exposition on Christ by showing that he's also superior to as the Son of Man using Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 to, four to 6 in his discussion. Now, this will help us in, uh, in following the flow of thought if we keep in mind that the Jewish Christians at this time were going through severe persecution, were being tempted to return to their religious ways, were being told that Jesus was just a man and therefore he was lower than the angels. Well, the following verses will show us that even as man, Jesus was, Jesus was better than the angels. And so this passage will show you why Christ had to come, why Jesus had to be born, why he had to, God had to come as a man and become superior so that we could fulfill our glorious destiny. All of you, if you are a born-again believer, have a glorious destiny. There is something wonderful awaiting all of you. And this passage here will show you that. So before we get into God's word, as we normally do, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us powerfully now. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have us here. You brought us here safe. I pray for those that... Um, are here that you will um, tell them, show them what it is they need to know, Lord. Bring them peace, bring them comfort. Reveal to them your majesty, your glory, your beauty, your mercy, your grace. The same with those that are watching and hearing this message as well, Lord that you will move powerfully in their lives, wherever they may be. That you will change hearts and minds and they will come to know your son personally as Lord and Savior. We are thankful for this opportunity. We are thankful that we, we are able to gather together as a church to, to read your word to fellowship without any fear of persecution, without any fear of the government coming to, to haul us off to prison or jail. But we do, we pray for those that are, that have to meet in secret. That you will strengthen them and be with them in those difficult times. So bless this time, Lord, as we get into your word and speak to us powerfully now. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We read the first four verses last week, and now we'll be picking up in verse 5. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For he has not subjected, subjected to to uh, angels, the world to come that we are talking about. 
but someone somewhere has testified, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste, taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Now, what would you do with a 19-year-old Christian young man who wrote in his diary, number nine, resolved to think much on all, occasion, on all occasions of my dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. As you read, through his seven, 70 resolutions, you, count, you will encounter things like, number seven, resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if, if it were the last hour of my life. Number 17, resolved that I will live so that I, as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. Now, if that young man lived in a modern evangelical home, his parents would probably be looking for maybe a good Christian psychologist to get this kid's thinking on the right track. Well, do you know who that young man was? It was Jonathan Edwards, who went on to become the great revivalist preacher of the first great awakening. His writings are still immensely helpful to believers 300 years later. Now, if you think he was gloomy, the gloomy, depressive type, I should point out that his first, res first resolution was, in part, number one, resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to the glory of God and my own good, profit and pleasure in the whole of my duration without any consideration of the time, whether now or never, so many myriads, myriads of ages hence. You see, Edwards realized that even as a teenager, that to live for God's glory, that to live for God's glory in light of death, and eternity was to live for the greatest personal good, profit, and pleasure. Sadly, there are many evangelical Christians today that are far too focused on the here and now. Many have lost the central focus that Edwards had, even as a teenager. Of living, of living each day in view of death and eternity. Nowadays, the modern view is, heaven is a nice thought, but I want the good life now. If Jesus can help me succeed in my family, in business, and in my personal emotional life, that's what I want. I'll think about heaven when I'm in my 80s. Because of short-sightedness, we tend not to han handle trials well. It therefore makes me wonder how we might handle persecution if it were to happen today. Now, one main reason for this weakness is that we're not focused on our glorious eternal destiny in Jesus Christ. As we've already seen, a main practical theme of this letter to the Hebrews is endurance under trials. The author frequently exhorts his readers, if we hold on to our confidence 
and the hope in which we boast. And also, for you need endurance, so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. So in order to give his readers the perspective to endure, the author focuses on their eternal destiny in Christ. You see, to endure our present sufferings, we must focus on the glory ahead in Christ. Now, in the passage we just read, the writer switches from challenging the reader and returns back to comforting them. See, the smallness of the tiny house church, the immensity of the hostile sea around them, and the mounting breakers of Nero's persecution left them feeling lonely and insignificant, like a forgotten cork in the tide. Knowing how they feel, he begins to show them how Christ, through his superiority, gives them massive significance in his ultimate intention for them. He does this with an implicit reference to the biblical reality that angels co-minister the present world under God's direction. Now, this view they had, it was a common view, and there's nothing wrong with that view. They co-minister. They do minister here. Uh, and again, this uh, belief was due to the long-held belief that at the time, angels had been placed by God over the nations of the world. You see, that's how we, they interpreted Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, which referred to the boundaries of the nations as set according to the number of God's angels. In addition to that, it says in Daniel chapter 10 and 21 that certain angels are designated as princes of Persia and Greece. And Michael is referred to as the great prince who watches over God's people, Israel. So for many, again, it was understood that the angels were always at work between heaven and earth on behalf of God's people. And since they saw their work as amazing and significant, they naturally just thought that they'd just continue on with it through God's kingdom and into eternity. However, the statement here in verse 5 forcefully refutes this view. Not angels, but people will be reward, awarded this dominion in the world to come. See, it's God's ultimate intention to have his kingdom ruled by redeemed men and women. So yes, these insignificant people in that small house church, a minuscule dot in a Roman empire, are destined to rule everything. But not just them but also every single person that is born again will too. It means even us as a small church, maybe at the time this would be, you know, at that time this would have been considered a small house church as well. Very insignificant. And when you think about all the churches that are here in El Paso, but we will one day, you will one day rule everything as co-heirs with Christ. The author establishes this as the ultimate intention by demonstrating that's, that this is in accord with the original intention of God for humanity. His proof is a, a quotation from the middle of Psalm 8 that celebrates God's original intention for man. He introduces and recites it in verses 6 through 8 of our text. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. 
this marvelous and beautiful declaration of God's intention can only be appreciated, really, can only be appreciated in the full context of the psalm. And there in Psalm 8, it says, When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. So, do you see what he's saying here? God's original plan for his people is mind-blowing, especially when you consider what we know about the universe, What's, what we've learned after all these centuries, after this was written, what, we, what science now tells us about the universe. See, the psalmist could only see a hint of the vastness and the glory of it. But now through modern technology, we see our planet spinning around our sun, which is only one of 100,000 million suns in our galaxy, which is only one of 100,000 million galaxies. So no wonder he, aston he astonishingly exclaimed, what is man that you remember him? or the son of man that you care for him. Have you ever thought about that when you looked up in the sky in a dark night? You know, I'm often asked, you know, what do I think about aliens? Do they exist? And really, for me, it doesn't matter. Do they exist? I don't think they do. And here's the thing, if, if this is true, if we are alone in this entire universe, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? This was all created for us. God created this entire universe and we are special to him. You're his, we're his children. I'm not going to get into the, that whole subject right here, right now. But that's what I think about when I look at the sky on those dark nights. All those stars, all those galaxies. And he remembers me. He knows me by name. He knows you by name. He loves you so, so much. But then he says something else that almost seems too outrageous to believe. In the middle of verse 8, he says, For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. What he's pointing out here is that there is nothing that, is, that isn't under man's dominion. Absolutely Nothing. But something went wrong. And the author knows that by now we're probably thinking, wait a moment, wait a moment, wait just a second. Slow your roll. Hold on. That's not true. But then he verbalizes it for us. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. Yeah, yeah, we don't see it. We don't see this, everything in this world subjected to us. The reality is that without the help of technology, we can't control, we can't really control any animals in the air or on the land or under the sea. In fact, Truth be told, man has a hard time controlling himself. Now, why is that? Well, when Adam sinned, one of the consequences was that man's God-given dominion became twisted, 
man's rule over creation has through the centuries become an ecological disaster. His reign over the animal world is superficial. He achieves it by intimidation. Obey me, or I'll eat you, or wear you. And the, the crazy thing is, and in some cases, man actually becomes the meal himself. The problem is, he can't rule over himself, let alone others. And so the saying, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, is lived out before the eyes of every generation in the same way that house church was living through it. Chesterton was right. Whatever is or is not true about men, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he was meant to be. Again, we're not given specifics, but when God created Adam, Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion over all of creation. Well, now in case some of you are asking, well, what about God's intention? Will, man, will man's alleged significance ever be achieved? Well, in verse 9, the answer is a resounding yes that echoes for all of eternity. And there it says, but we see Jesus. And that, my friends, is God's answer to man's dilemma. Not only is God, God's original intention achieved, but his ultimate intention is achieved in Christ, the second Adam. See, Jesus Christ became man that he might suffer and die for man's sin and restore the dominion that was lost because of sin. If you think about it, when he was here on earth, he exercised that lost dominion. In Matthew chapter 17 and Luke 5, we see him have, um, he had that dominion over the fish. In Luke chapter 22, he exercised dominion over the birds. In Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, over the wild beasts. And in Mark chapter 11, over the domesticated beasts. As the last Adam, Jesus Christ regained man's lost dominion. And now to this day, everything, everything is under his feet. The initial phrase of verse Nine, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, was fulfilled when he was born. But whereas the height of exaltation for man is being made a little lower than the angels, it was for Jesus the depth of humiliation. God coming down and becoming man was the depth of humiliation. Jesus stooped to reach down to the height of man's glory. Significantly, this is the first use of the name Jesus in the book of Hebrews. And it's emphatic, stressing his humanity and his work of salvation. It's the name it was a name given to him by Gabriel at his birth. And it means the Lord is salvation. The next phrase, but we see Jesus now crowned with glory and honor was fulfilled. As verse nine goes on to say, because he suffered death. Now, Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter two, verses eight through ten. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the, birth, to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted and gave him the name that is above all every name, 
so that, the name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. So we see that in Christ, man's glorious potential was realized. Everything was put under his feet. As we look around, we certainly see that not everything is subject to man. But we see, but we see Jesus exalted and all creation is subject to him. And with this, the possibility of man fulfilling God, God's ultimate intention is made possible. Christ's glorification is our foothold in glory. There are many things, my friends, that are that will not, that just simply won't be understood until we see Jesus, until we actually see him face to face. The answers to life's most perplexing questions are not found in asking why. The greatest, the greatest answer is a who, Jesus Christ. Now, some wish they might truly see Jesus with their natural eyes. Some just are waiting for that, are just hoping for that. Jesus will just appear physically right in front of them. Instead of wanting to see him with the eyes of faith. Yet, as Spurgeon said, sight is very frequently used in scripture as a metaphor. An illustration, a symbol to set forth what faith is. Faith is the eye of the soul. It is the act of looking into, sorry, looking unto Jesus. Think of how many, how many people saw Jesus with their own two eyes and yet resisted him, mocked him, and rejected him. It's better to see Jesus with the eye of faith than with the natural eye. It doesn't say we can see Jesus, though that's true. It doesn't say we have seen Jesus, though that was uh, true of some in his day. It doesn't say we shall see Jesus, though that is certainly true. It says we see Jesus both now and continually. He is the focus, the center, the main aspect of our spiritual life. And so, church, Christian, look unto Jesus with the eye of faith. As imperfect as your vision of faith may be, look unto him who is perfect. See him as the one who loved sinners and died for them. See him as your savior. See him as your master. See him as your friend. See him as your forerunner. See him as your healer. See him at work, at home, out and about. Not only, not just here when you're worshiping, but see him everywhere at all times. See him with the eyes of faith. Now in verse 9, it says, so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. The word taste is a Hebrew metaphor that doesn't mean sim simply to sample something, but to partake fully. Jesus' real death for us procured our reign. As Paul explains in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. If by the one, man, one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, 
Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and, 6 and 7 expands on this idea of reigning with him as it says, He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches, immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Because we've been redeemed, our solidarity with Christ is so close that, it, that it's described as being in him. Paul uses that designation some 169 times in his writings. The term suggests an exchange, an impartation from Christ. So you see, being in Christ, the redeemed are so united with him that they share in the glory and dominion of his reign. So as we've seen, the writer is doing his best in this section to comfort the afflicted in this beleaguered little church. The illusion of insignificance has wrapped its cold fingers around many of their hearts. They feel like an unwanted speck among the millions of the, of the Roman Empire. But that's just an illusion. The reality is they are indeed sub-microscopic spots in a huge fallen universe but as god's children they are objects of outstanding astounding attention for god is minute, minutely mindful of them and cares for them in the greatest detail now let me switch it around and just direct it towards all of you Maybe you feel insignificant or the illusion, the belief that you're insignificant has wrapped its cold fingers around your heart and you feel like an unwanted speck among the millions of Americans living in this country, that you don't matter, but that's just an illusion. God is minutely mindful of you and cares about every single detail about your life. He cares when you're happy. He cares when you're sad. He cares when you're sick. He cares when you're lonely. He cares when you're confused. He cares about all those things. Don't ever Listen to that lie that you're insignificant. You're just, God has better things to worry about, bigger things that he is concerned about, that he's working on. He cares about you. He cares about each and every one of you. Not only that, he has an ultimate intention for them, for you that no angel will ever attain to rule the world to come. No Roman emperor in all his glory could experience a fraction of the glorious reign that is to be ours, that is to be yours. Moreover, the reign has already begun, begun because now you're in Christ Jesus. Now you're in Christ. Christ on the cross is the measure of your worth. Christ on the throne is a prophecy of your significance and sure dominion. And so this is meant to comfort you. This is meant to encourage you. You may... 
journey into a great city like New York City or Chicago or even here in downtown El Paso and walk through the maze of streets and skyscrapers with an existential sense of significance on the level of a gnat. Your workplace, perhaps, within the dark recesses of a granite landmark. And your comings and goings would mean less than nothing to this entire city or any other major city. But on the authority of God's word, you are important and of infinite value. You are just a little lower than the angels. But you will be crowned with glory and honor. Everything will be put under your feet. So you may say, how can this be? How can this happen? I don't see it. Let me refer back to you. Let me refer back to that verse. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor. Church, Christian, he is our promise. He is God's ultimate intention for us. And so now hopefully you now understand the flow of thought in this text. So then how... Should we apply these verses practically? Let me share a few. First, we shouldn't let the present trials cause us to neglect our great salvation. Because one day we will reign with Christ. A.W. Pink, in his exposition of Hebrew, said, The practical bearings of this verse on the Hebrews was continue to hold fast your allegiance to Christ. For the time is coming when those who do shall enter into into a glory into a glory surpassing that of the angels. In other words, we need to develop and maintain the eternal perspective of our glorious destiny in Christ. So that we can enjoy, so that we can endure endure joyfully in this present, in our present trials. If Jesus had to suffer and then enter his glory, and guess what? So do we. God used suffering to perfect his son. And he does so with us. Jonathan Edwards was right. We should focus often on the shortness of life in light of eternity. You, you guys know who the who uh, Victoria the Queen who Vict- Queen Victoria was. She was the Queen of England from 1837 to 1901. When she was young. She was shielded from the fact that she would be the next ruling monarch of England because such knowledge, it just might spoil her. When her teacher finally let her discover that she would one day be queen of England, Victoria's res- response was, and that would be good. Her life would be controlled by her future destiny. Our situation should parallel hers. Our future destiny is that we will reign with Jesus Christ, not just for a few years, not just for for 80 years, 90 years. No, not at all. Forever. Throughout all of eternity. Our knowledge of that should enable us to endure whatever present sufferings 
and hardships and trials that we're going through, that you're going through. The knowledge again that you will be with Christ and you will reign with Christ for all of eternity it should help you to endure those hard times. We should live as set apart unto Christ because we look to our glorious destiny. Second, by faith, we should see Jesus and marvel at what he did for us and that we are now in him. He left the splendor of heaven and not only took on human flesh, but he also went to the cross on our behalf. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die, should, shouldst die for me? That's why our Lord ordained communion so that we should remember him and what he did on the cross for us. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul, he daily Daily, he saw Jesus who endured the cross on his behalf and he saw himself in Christ so that all the benefits of Christ's death applied to him. So that's exactly how you, each and every one of you, should live each and every day. Is that your mindset as when you wake up in the morning and when you go throughout the day, all the way to the point, all the way to when you go to bed, you see yourself in Christ so that all the benefits of his death are applied to you. Third, if you feel weak, despised, or insignificant, in this evil world, my friends, take courage. In Christ, you are more than conquerors. Although it's difficult to fathom, in the ages to come, we will reign with Christ in his kingdom. So it doesn't really matter what the world thinks of you. It doesn't really matter what your bosses think of you. It doesn't really matter what your peers think of you. What really matters is what God thinks of you. If you've trusted Christ as the one who bore your sins on the cross, then God has imputed his righteousness to you. Do you know what that means? Jesus' righteousness has now been put on you. You're now righteous in God's sight. You have been purified from your sins. God will no longer look at you as an unredeemed, unsaved, unbelieving sinner. Jesus' righteousness has been placed on you, and that's how he sees you. White as snow. You can know that although you're just a speck on this planet, which is just a speck in this gigantic universe, God cares for you. And he does have a purpose for your life. He does have a plan and purpose 
for you, each and every one of you. That purpose transcends the short life we have in this body, in this tent, and it extends all the way through eternity in our glorified bodies that we will receive when Christ returns. But now, there's a final truth that may apply to some of you that are listening to this. If you're not in Christ, you should be scared. You should be fearful, like greatly fearful. See, though right now, he's despised and ignored by millions and billions around the world. A day is coming when they will cry out for the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. He is the chief cornerstone which the builders rejected. If you build your life on him, you will find a sure foundation from every single storm in life, no matter how great it is. But, that sto- but if that stone falls on you, know this. Know this without a shadow of a doubt. That stone will scatter you like dust. It says in Psalm chapter 2, verse 12, Pay homage to the Son, or He will be angry, and you will perish in your rebellion. For His anger may ignite at any moment. But in the final line of that verse is an encouraging and hopeful message that reads, All who take refuge in Him are happy. If you've been rebellious your whole entire life, whether it's 20 years or 80 years, you can still find refuge in Him. It's never too late. You're never too young, never too old. He will save you and rescue you and free you from sin and death. You will reign with him and be with him for all of eternity. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting again for that moment when things are right, when things are perfect, when all situations seem to fall into place, when you've made it in your career, when you've have you that certain amount in your bank account? You have the right wife. You have the children that, or husband, and you have the children that you need. Are you, are you waiting? That day may never come. Are you waiting to, before you take that final breath? Well, you may not have that chance. You do not want to suffer the wrath of God's righteous indignation. It'll be the worst thing that you will ever, ever go through or have ever gone through. There's hope, though, in Jesus. And all you have to do is come to the cross and lay your sins before the cross and just give it all to him. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Confess him. Believe in him. Trust in him. Know that he is Savior, that he is Lord. That he rose again on the third day. And is now sitting at the right hand of God. Interceding for you. Jesus is greater than all those angels. He's given us now a glorious destiny. He's given you all a glorious destiny. 
Will you walk down that path? Will you meet him? If you are and if you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So with all your heart and with all sincerity, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. If you can, if you're able to, you can go on your knees. You can pray this out loud or yeah, the Lord wants to hear your voice. Say this, pray this. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe without a shadow of a doubt, 100% certainty that you died for my sins and that three days later you rose from the dead. So now I turn from my sins. I repent of everything I've done. All those sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for dying for me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me the rest of my life in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you truly prayed that, you've been forgiven. You'll be reigning with Christ. If you were to die today at, the, today at this very moment or five seconds from now, ten minutes from now, you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you'll be reigning with Christ with him for all of eternity. He died for you. And now you'll be with him because you're in him. So if you prayed that, let us know. We want to hear your story. Thank you for watching this week. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And if there's anything we can do, you can contact us at our website. Uh, our information is there. Our phone number or address is there. Um, have a great week. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.